Hey guys, and welcome back to Talking with Shadows, the conversation everybody has, but no one wants to admit to. Here with your host, Vic Whateley. Arg, And your captain, Marcus D. As we talk about high strangeness on the high seas. Marcus, why, why are you doing that? Because it's cool to talk like a pirate. It's true that it's cool to talk like a pirate, but not the way you're doing it. I'm trying to kind of, I'm trying to set a mood for the episode, man. We're talking about... I, Marcus... Ye pirate voice be mighty weak. Mighty weak indeed. I had way more R in mind than you did. Yeah, but all, was, that's all you got. There was more government. You... And you have a beard. You look like a pirate, and I had more, like, of a pirate tone than you, than all, you did. All you've got is the R. No, I had, also, I had the attitude. Thank okay, you very guys, much. If you didn't catch on already, we're going to be talking about some crazy stuff happening on the ocean. Absolutely. Um, and we want to welcome you guys back to the podcast, by the way, uh, and always want to thank you guys for listening. And we want to give a big shout out uh, to some good friends of ours, uh, Tyler and Jank from the Fartmouth podcast that I was recently on. These guys were actually some pretty cool dudes. Uh, they uh, call themselves the dirtiest podcast uh, on the internet, and it is true. Uh, if you go on there and listen to their stuff, they have some pretty uh, well, colorful uh, language and stuff that they talk about on the podcast, but it was a lot of fun. They actually were very surprised uh, when I came onto their podcast about whether or not if I'd even want to do it, and I was like, yeah, sure, because, you know, this this sounds like it's going to be fun, it's really cool, we're going to talk about stuff with the paranormal and have some fun while we did it, and I had a really good time. You guys should check out their podcast. Uh, we'll put a, a link to their podcast in the show notes for you guys to go check them out. So, how was their breath? Uh, it was okay. Uh, they had donuts for me, by the way, thank you very much. You have never... Had donuts waiting for me at the start of any episode. That's true. I, I really would have guessed with a, a podcast named like Fart Mouth, their brother would have been horrid. <laughs> uh, but great, uh, great group of dudes. Very smart guys uh, that know a lot of stuff. And oh my god, the 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 music stuff that they were playing, the uh, the parody songs that they were doing was actually pretty cool. And you guys should check out uh, their stuff. Um, but th this is going to be a fantastic episode. Me and Vic have been wanting to do this topic for a while. Well, yeah, I've been pushing this one yes. for a couple years now. Yes, and we want to make sure uh, that we get to talking about it, but we're going to go over the comments uh, from our last episode. Oh, wow, you guys did a lot of comedy you on the did. last we, one. We were watching, which is really cool, and we love it whenever we see... Uh, our listeners talking to each other in the comments below. Oh, yeah. We really appreciate the comments, guys. Oh, absolutely. And we have some great stuff. Uh, if you didn't check out our last episode, we talked about uh, crazy clown phenomena. Like the tons of different types of crazy clown phenomena that's out there. As well as how it's all kind of similar and almost all connected. It is a fantastic episode that you guys should definitely check out. One of them, probably my most favorite that we've done so far. All right, so uh, Austin Lee commented, "Love this channel and, and to hell with clowns." Cheers to that, by the way, Austin. Oh yeah, all about that response. Yeah, never realized how uh, mind shattering it'd be to open your blinds and there's an angry, smiling clown staring at your window. I agree, and I also continue to not understand why more of those stories uh, don't end with, "And then I pulled out my gun." So that's probably going to be my response. If something like that would happen to me. Superfan Creepy California commented. Uh, Creepy California said, My mom and dad had a run-in with a weird clown and it sounded similar to your Harlequin description. This happened when my parents were in their 20s and on Halloween a clown was following them around. Uh, it had been creeping my pops out and as they were trying to lose it, they saw it following on the roofs of the houses, and these houses have close to a nine-foot gap, so either this dude was really good at jumping or something else. Uh, it still bothers them to this day. They have no clue what it was or what was following them. I always thought for intelligent, paranormal, predatory entities, Halloween would have to be a smorgasbord. 
because it would be hard as heck to actually successfully report them or get any support for like anything going on. Absolutely. Like most, a lot of cities have uh, local laws that ban you from wearing masks except around like certain holidays at the time of the year. So that would be a perfect time for something like this to be stalking people. Absolutely. Fantastic, man. Thank you for the, thank you for the uh, story. That was really awesome. Shannon Zipados fan 46. I really hope I said that right. I apologize if I butchered that. Says, uh, would you do videos covering the Frederick uh, Zazabi, the Sandone Clown, the Grinning Man of Glasgow, Scotland, Puckwudgy, and uh, Bremerton Monstrosity? Well, uh, I'm not going to comment if we're going to do them, but keep an eye out for next week's yes, episode. Yes, you should. You should see next week's episode when I will be on vacation. However, we're going to record the uh, the episode ahead of time so that you we're guys... We're actually recording that episode tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, so... Yeah, so... That way you guys don't have a lapse in content. Gray9438 said, I've always felt like the Phantom Clowns could represent a trickster entity of sorts. That part you mentioned about waves occurring around elections could be the into that as them being some sort of precursor to a societal change. Uh, another interesting thing I heard of was from a documentary, I believe it was called Killer Legends, was where they talked about us neutering the idea of clowns by making them more kid friendly. Idea we have today that is possible, archetype itself is representing to it by becoming more sinister. Yeah, I could see that playing in with the trickster archetype. The trickster archetype is often associated with like being a herald of change, chaos, upheaval, or just even the changing of a guard. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Gray9438 also says, the most recent clown wave was in 2016. I remember I was at a friend's and we basically spent most of the day watching clown encounter videos and then being super paranoid on my walk home that night. Absolutely. I totally understand that. And if you go back and if you listen uh, to people that talked about having like just these bizarre clown uh, run-ins back in the day, most of the law enforcement said that they never actually caught anybody. There was a very small handful, and even in many of those cases, they actually <laughs> felt that these were people that were just goofing rather than being anybody that actually was doing any of these stockings. Uh, last one we got is going to be from Ari Konovitz. Ari says, to be fair, I saw and heard about shadow beings, which I think are Jen, Fei, and Mimi, going back to the 90s. But I didn't hear any of them in the media until way later. Uh, one of my first encounters was a plain clad old man and an improbable situation, which was just sort of an unusual memory until I listened to Strange Familiars podcast. Great podcast, by the way. I also listened to that podcast. Me too. Coincidentally, that same cast interviewed somebody talking about the same local uh, person that she encountered. And, and through anxiety or later substances, I've known a scary clown most of my life. And I've heard about it back to stories in childhood. Sometimes it seems these stories take a little time to come out. But there does seem to be a social memory of many odd things that often stretch back a little further than the conified version. Edit. When I... On a, uh, when an honest history is written and read, we'll all realize the existence is a lot more uh, King Lovecraft than we'd like. Maybe that's why they all tell us calming tales of the mundane and try to direct our fear at each other. Uh, absolutely. Um, it is many of the times that a lot of times we don't hear about a lot of these entities until much later, until people start coming forward. I think that's a big part of... I think why a lot of people don't come forward to the paranormal is they're always afraid of either not being taken seriously or people thinking that they're crazy, not realizing that many people have had similar situations with them. The more we talk about the strange clown phenomenon, per se, the more we start realizing so many other people have had similar clown experiences, and yet you try going on the internet to investigate this stuff, and it is like grasping at straws and checking you know and trying to catch ghosts if you will trying to track these stories down i did not get that that was king slash lovecraft referring to the two writers i took that as king lovecraft as in lovecraft was a king i'm like yeah he needs to be, he's a really good writer i really like lovecraft but i've never heard of someone call him a king before it just now set in that <laughs> what you're talking about and yeah you're you're right you're right 
but as always, guys, thank you so much for all of the comments that you guys did. Again, if you guys are listening to this podcast for the first time, please put your comments wherever you guys hear this. We love reading comments and respond to them, even if they're negative. We will still do that, unlike most other podcasts, I think. We'll just skip them. We'll, we'll read them and respond There's to them. There's a threshold. There's a threshold to negativity. <laughs> well, okay, sorry. If somebody posts something that's like just clearly offensive, I'm going to just delete that comment because you suck as a human being. So... Just do better. But, but, like, if it's constructive criticism, yeah, we'll probably read it. Absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so I think it is time to get into our topic of the day. The Orang Medan. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So do you want to do, do you want to, do you want to tell the story or do you want me to tell the story? Uh, I don't have my notes from me, so I don't have the dates. If you're willing to chime in with the dates. I am willing to chime in the dates. So, the... Okay, the the first important thing to remember, to, or to note about the Oramadan story, is there is differences of opinion as to when this event actually went down. Some people state that it occurs in 19, about the summer of 1947, all the way up to about the summer of 1948 within this time span. But that's typically when most people think that this actually went down. Okay. ASOS goes out from the Orang Madam. It says that all officers are dead, that the crew is likely dead, and then it's a bunch of jarbled uh, nonsense for a moment. And then a, a follow-up saying, I die. Immediately, um, a co- or the warning goes out and any ships are asked to respond that can. Two ships uh, respond. The first one to get there is the it's a city something star. S- uh, it is the Silver Star. Silver Star. As well as the city of Baltimore is the second ship. Okay. Well, the Silver Star gets there, and they start to board it. And the first thing they notice is it's just kind of drifting. But the ship has n- no obvious signs of any serious damage. So they start boarding the ship, and the first thing they notice is that the crew, many of them are up on the top deck... Just lean back, lips curled back, staring up into the sky, their limbs lifted and locked in just kind of a defensive position, and clearly all dead. As they begin to investigate the ship, they find a staff dog, similar situation as the humans. They find um, the uh, the officers in the uh, wheel room. They find uh, other crew working below, all dead in these bizarre positions. And eventually they do find the telegraph operator who has sent out the SOS. And he's dead right next to the machine. Almost as if he had died just right then while they're sending it. So these guys have no clue what's going on. They're thrust into this bizarre situation now. And they decide, okay, we're going to tow this back. While they're setting up the tows, suddenly smoke comes up from below the deck. And they cut the ropes just as the meringue madame explodes with enough force to thrust it out of the water. And they're left going back to shore with a very strange tale and very few answers. That is a freaky story. Okay. Like, that is a lot to, that is a lot to break down. Okay. I, I, where do you I, want to start trying to I know to break where I want to down. start. Okay, where, where do you want to start? Just imagining what it'd be like... To step onto the deck of that boat and seeing all the crewmen just lips pulled back, eyes locked in a gaze up at the sun, their arms twisted in a defensive position, and just how eerie that's going to be right there. Like, I know that a lot of sailors see a lot of horrifying stuff on the seas but i can't imagine like just coming onto a ship and just seeing that kind of a horrific scene like actually speaking of stuff like back from the comments that i that ari was talking about like something out of a lovecrafty and a horror novel that's what i was gonna say like this the the beginning of this has such a lovecraft sort of feel to it like i feel like the sky opened up and they saw something that they couldn't like, handle and everyone fell into insanity on the deck. Like, I was waiting when I first heard the, the, the story for, like, them to find the captain in his captain quarters with a bunch of carved runes, runic <laughs> symbols everywhere and him being the only one left alive just staring at it being like, you must see, be, like, see the truth beyond the truth or something just insane like that. 
But yeah, oh man, just just the atmosphere that had to be going around in that moment. Well, the people that were investigating the ship, they go down into the bowels of the ship and they go to the furnace room. But even in the furnace room, they describe still having like a chilling sensation oh. while they're being down there. Oh yeah, the whole time that they're on there, and keep in mind the temperature was around 100 to 110 degrees that day. They were consistently de describing it as being tens of degrees colder while on board this ship. That the whole ship was possessed of a bizarre coldness. Now, I'm going to ask you, because, I mean, we were kind of prepping for this episode. We, we had a disagreement as to what, is that something that's necessarily paranormal? Or is this an effect that they're having because they're seeing such a traumatic event? I mean, think about when anybody sees something like a really traumatic scene. They describe it chilling them to the bone i mean i we've seen some pretty scary stuff at work that we've walked into and i i still had like the shivers and, and chills run through me seeing some of the stuff that we've either read or seen i don't know i trust the eyewitnesses on this one uh, they their investigation of the ship would have taken a while mm. and i think that likely they're describing a legitimate stimuli that they were feeling that this was more than just a emotional reaction that there was something odd going on that they took note of Another uh, another odd anomaly that uh, they said was that the bodies were decaying abnormally fast. Now, they don't give us a lot of information on what is meant by that. So I'm simply going to infer from that that they are, they're, seeing, they're showing signs of decay that would be faster than normal for that area. Which is kind of odd when you think about what the prevailing theory as to what caused this was the well, let's go we should probably just jump straight into the yeah. prevailing theory then. yeah so the, the 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 prevailing theory behind the events that caused the what happened on the ramadan was that supposedly maybe the ramadan was transporting cargo beneath it that was essentially poisons or toxins such as potassium cyanide nerve gases sulfuric acid other weird nefarious gases and somehow there was a leak in one of these things or there was an accident that caused essentially poisonous gas that went up to everybody on the ship, and that's what caused them all to to go into these weird positions and cause these things. Now, there's a lot about that story I'm not totally sold on, but I think that that version might hold some truth. But I think that there there are certain holes within it as well. Like when I when I hear that story, it makes me kind of believe that because it reminded me back of this movie that I that I watched called The Chamber with Gene Hackman. And if you've never seen that movie, it's a very it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty good movie. In that movie, Gene Hackman plays a plays one of the last people to be uh, killed using the gas chamber. And one of the things he's describing as to what happens to people whenever they're executed by essentially poisonous gases um, is that they'll convulse and they'll contort their body. And one of the things that will happen is their lips and mouth will go into this weird, twisted, sick smile, like like thin lips. And it's really chilling to watch. And when you listen to the to the accounts of the sailors who found the Ramadan and the guys that are on the ship, they're all contorted with these weird, with their mouths and stuff wide open as they're staring, and like just staring off into nothing. Well, they just say that the mouth is pulled back, so that could also be signs of like bacterial rot. Because right. one of the first things to rot is the lips. Mm -hmm. We're just not totally sure on that. But here's one of the things that, uh, here's one of the first things that jump jumps out at me. They're in a well-ventilated area. Um, like you could easily get up to the deck, and many of them were found dead on the deck. But also... Why would one of the last people holding on, sending out transmission, be someone who's below deck? Doesn't that seem odd? Like, say that one more time. Okay. So, one of the last people holding on is believed to be the person sending out the telegraph. Right. But he's going to be below deck. He's not going to be in the ventilated or a well-ventilated area. He should be one of the first people to die. He, he shouldn't be one of the last people holding on. That's true. That's true. That is weird. There's a lot of weird inconsistencies whenever people just throw in the idea that this was just some sort of a chemical agent that was released into this. Well, I think you're also talking about too, like if they said that the bodies were in a in a a rapid state of decay, right? Yeah, and that leads me to think that perhaps not so much a chemical agent, 
but maybe more of a biological agent. I mean, decay is effectively the, the rate that bacteria is breaking down your body. Um, there's a lot of factors in it, like uh, what substrate you're lying on, moisture in the air, things like that. This, the same way, like, you, you throw something in a swampy area that's warm, it's going to break down decay very quickly. But if you put something up in the Andes, you, there's pre, prehistoric animals that have died up there, and it still has meat because the decay rate is that slow there. Um, it's almost entirely inert in that area. Um, probably decay rate for that area, the normal rate is probably going to be fairly quick. We're talking a warm, moist environment, probably not as fast as a swamp, but still fairly quick. But my thought is maybe some sort of bacterial agent got released, and that would easily explain um, the accelerated um, decay. Because think about, like, say, a, um, a Komodo dragon. They're considered to be poisonous, but not in the traditional sense are they poisonous. They don't have like neurotoxins or things like that like uh, many snakes do or tissue toxins or other toxins. Their mouth is just so laden with bacteria that when they bite you they give you such a bacterial load that you can't overcome. Your bike just cannot fight off that amount of bacteria all at once and that bacteria is going to just start breaking you down and you're eventually just going to die and they're going to eat your body or eat you when you just are too injured to run. Well, if this was some sort of gas leak that happened, again, wouldn't it just be feasible then to get on life rafts or get on something to get away from the boat? Rather than to say, like, if it's a biological attack, they would realize that there's really not much that they could do because it's not like you could, like, you know, outrow a disease... Well, the thing is, I think either way, these people had, n and I'm not totally sold on that. It's not something much stranger than the than these two options. But mm -hmm. if we're talking about these two options, we're going to assume that they're smugglers. Or they're on this uh, this area they're found in is a smuggler's route. There's not a lot of reason for someone to be taking this if you're not, uh, not taking this route if you're not a smuggler. Um, they likely did not know what they're transporting. They're probably asked to transport this box, <laughs> put it in the cargo hold, drop it off in this place. Like, like and they probably had no clue what they're exposed and to. And now, don't get me wrong. Like, I don't know for sure if smugglers are held to the same OSHA standards as like most liners. I'm gonna say there's probably some corner cutting that's probably going on. <laughs> yeah, and. Uh, but uh, but either way, they probably had no clue what was happening to them. Well, it, it creates this air of mystery because when you when you talk about the Arima Dam too, what you're going to run into is a lot of times too is the people are going to tell you that there is no ship with the registry like registered as the Orang Madan. Like there's just there is there isn't one, especially not one within the you know the um with 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 the Dutch fleet. Which again, though, if you're tr if you're smuggling something that you're not supposed to, you're doing something that's clandestine or covert or something like that. Of course, that you're probably not gonna, you know, have the correct ship name on the the registry. Yeah, and I'd almost, I really feel like these were likely smugglers because that strait they're in is not a good strait for transporting things. It tends to be a dangerous strait. It's kind of rocky. Um, it's also a, a frequent haunt for pirates and things like that. There's just a lot of reasons standard merchants did not sail through there. Now, I don't understand why I'm not, why I'm the only one that, that, that came to this, this weird thought when I'm, when I was listening to the story of the Remedan. Like, doesn't it seem a little coincidental that these two ships showed up right at the perfect moment for this ship to explode? Like, they, they all got off the ship in time for them to all safely get away and not be on the ship when it explodes. Oh, I'll definitely see that second point to you. That is awfully coincidental. Now, for the first point, they aren't that far from standard shipping lanes. It makes sense that there would be ships that could respond. But the timing of their escape is very fortuitous. Yeah, like, we, 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 we got everybody off of the boat. We tethered it, and we and right as we're about to, you know, leave and do the responsible thing, which is tow this shit back to port, it explodes. We huh. should get into there's a fire. We should get into some of the more clandestine aspects of this. Absolutely, absolutely. So one of the biggest theories surrounding the Remedang is that maybe they were transporting goods or things other than goods uh, from the Japanese special 
uh, Unit 731. Now, if you guys are not familiar with uh, Unit 731, Unit 731 is a clandestine Japanese secret chemical and biological weapons uh, organization that essentially did some very heinous ex human experimentation during World War II. Their whole mission was to try to create dangerous chemical and biological agents to use against the Allies during this time. Now, after the end of World War II, and many of these people were being brought up under war crimes, uh, the United States doesn't exactly have the uh, most, uh, what's it called, moral track record with handling some of these, some of these people. Uh, Operation Paperclip, we could start there, if you guys aren't familiar with Operation Paperclip. Operation Paperclip was essentially the program where the United States government re uh, essentially hired many of the physicists and people that were working on the nuclear projects inside Germany. Uh, the United States government saw what was going on in Unit 731 and went, Hey guys, you want to come work for the U.S. government? And uh, offered many of these scientists uh, immunity in exchange for providing them with knowledge of their chemical and biological weapons. And they offered them immunity and protection from the USSR, who was also rounding these people up. Yeah, so it would have been very possible for the uh, for some for for during this time, whenever they're trying to essentially smuggle equipment and people out of occupied Japan at this time to the United States, and then something go wrong, because again, during this time, the United States government and the Soviet Union was kind of doing this as fast as they could, rounding up all of these supplies and equipment and trying to keep it from the other. So this could explain why there was a smuggling operation going on in this area trying to get something to the United States or somewhere else. And although this is a very popular theory and there it is very interesting, it's mainly put together backwards. It's put together from the perspective of what could have caused this strange reaction, maybe chemicals, this could have been a shipping route for them. There's not a whole lot to back it up beyond the reverse engineering from the side effects. Uh, I bring up another point uh, that I want to bring up during this thing. And maybe we're, maybe I'm just throwing a monkey wrench into the conversation here. So during the Ray Madame's uh, SOS call, what happens? The SOS call goes out where they're saying, help us, all of, all of our people are dying. This is what's going on. There's gibberish that nobody understands. And then the last thing, which is, I die. I go back to that gibberish. Were you thinking that it's a code? Because I was yes. thinking that it could have been a code. It's gibberish to people who don't understand it. But maybe if you're sending out something saying SOS, secret biological chemical weapons about to fall into enemy hands. And all of a sudden these two American ships show up pretty quick. Like, there's a lot. Okay. I'm really torn to say between saying that... There were likely not agents on the ships that showed up, and these people were just the luckiest, luckiest sailors in the world and got off just in time before it exploded. And saying maybe they were so paranoid they just had people on pretty much all these ships and just planted, when they went to respond, planted uh, explosives. I, I'm very torn between those two perspectives, and I'm having a hard time settling on one. <laughs> if it is a clandestine operation, it would make sense that they would take some precautions to watch it, and maybe these were in t these people were intentionally shadowing them, but we just don't have a whole lot of evidence to say that that's definitely the case. Oh, and one of the things a lot of people who detract from um, the story of the of Orang Benem, it, they'll say that the uh, Silver Star wasn't on any registries either. At the time, it was not known as the Silver Star. It was known as the Santuana. And then it was later purchased, and then that ship became the Silver Star. So it was totally legit. Oh, absolutely. But also keep in mind, if you're trying to cover up exactly what particular type of ship this was, because you don't want people to track what kind of ship may have been transporting goods, it would have been very easy for people probably just to make up a ship name, like the Rang Banan or something like that. Mm hmm by the way. Do you know that there is a sea serpent in that area too? Did you in know that there specific strait? Did you know there's a popular video game called The Man of Yes, Bidet? there is. Yes, there is. <laughs> that many people have discovered that the <laughs> origin of that game is this story. 
I hope that that brings a lot more people to the conversation because it really is an interesting one. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna go real deep into it because I can't draw conditions. Like I, I did some digging into um, this area, trying to figure out what folklore exists there and trying to see if anything could be connected. And unless this sea serpent can come up on a deck, exhale a cloud of deadly bacteria, and then would then leave without eating any of the corpses, <laughs> I really feel like the sea serpent's unconnected, and that is the closest thing in the local folklore. Like, this is the area that was once ruled by the kingdom of Mahapayat, and they, and I probably butchered that a little bit, but, and they had a, a lot of lore associated with this area, but... Nothing that really fits the bill. There's one about, like, <laughs> this fairy trying to, like, screw over this king by making all these unrealistic demands, but it has nothing to do with ships. So there's not a whole lot in the local legends that you can really use to really solidify as far as this story. Like, if this was some kind of a sea monster, it probably would have been a sea monster with the nicest table manners that I've ever seen. It just popped in some, I'm just gonna eat one of these. Mm, just gonna make clean my mess up here, yeah. and then just and then just slithered away. Well, one of the interesting things about the case is that um, it's described that their hands are up in like defensive poses, mm -hmm. but there's no wounds on anyone. Uh, it at least seems like they believe they were defending themselves against something. Now, like it could have been something that caused them to hallucinate. Like they could have taken something and then all like just start hallucinating and they think they throw their hand and that's why they throw their hands up in these weird defensive positions. Now, why their hands get stuck like that, I have no idea. I can't explain that for anything. That you know, just because you hallucinate on one of these things isn't gonna be why your hands are in the air. Also keep in mind, for you to go into like rigor mortis like that, you're you have to stop like you have to like die with your hands up and they keep staying up like that. And that's I just don't see that being a thing. Like, and another thing that the is hard to explain is, like, the bizarre temperature anomaly that's going on. Like, being that that is part of the report that's lasted this long in time, I'm tempted to give it some credence. But it kind of flies in the face of everything. Because you normally, you normally associate temperature anomalies like that with, you know, ghosts and things along those lines. And there have been people who have thrown out the idea that this was some sort of sea ghost attack or pirate ghost attack and like but the thing is it it that that idea only fits with the the temperature anomaly it's the problem is there's a lot of theories on this but none of them fully fit everything yeah. none of them answer every one of the questions it, it, and a lot of them only answer one question it, it, it's like you're it's like any answer you give to this you're just trying to force yeah you're trying to force a a jigsaw puzzle together, but you're dealing with like four different puzzles, and and, and you you go ta da done, and it just doesn't look like anything. Like I'm still very skeptical of it being a gas because I the gas makes sense for taking out everyone who's below deck. That makes a ton of sense, but the people who are going to be up on the surface, you should see at least some of them surviving, even if it's a really villarant gas. Sure, so there's villarant gases that you can breathe in, and, you know, it's probably going to kill some of them, but it's probably not going to kill all of them if some of them made it to the surface. Look, I think it's going to have to be something that attacks the muscle system or the nervous system that's going to leave someone's limbs in that contorted position. Because, again, if they just did something that just biologically... Just that, that was like a virus or something. When they die, they're just gonna be slumped over or something like that. They're not gonna have their limbs up like that. It's gonna have to be something that physically affects them in some sort of way. Like well, I said, it could be something bacterial based, causing um, causing uh, decay to set in abnormally mm -hmm. fast. It would have to be something extremely virulent. But then at the same time, it's not going to spread as easily. And how did it get to the whole crew? Are they all just walking around touching each other's faces? <laughs> Like, is this a bacteria that also makes you run around and lick all the door handles? Like, is this something like, like is it something like the coronavirus of the day? Where it's like, don't touch your face, but then it just makes you want to touch your face? Yeah. Or something like that? There's so many holes in about every story, man. It is hard to nail down a singular conclusion. Like, a lot of people also throw out aliens on this one. But... Yeah, aliens would probably have the technology to cause these sort of effects... And USOs are a thing, and they've been sad for a long time. There was this letter written to the CIA connecting this with some things that are also connected to USOs. 
But uh, it seems like a therefore aliens answer to me. Like, I really wish we had a slightly better picture of what's going on. Even a few more details could help us out on narrowing the situation. But the problem is we're, we're lacking on some of those. We're lacking on some of those key points. I really love the private letter to the CIA that gets brought up in many videos about this. Because this is really cool. This just, to me, it just shows how popular this story has always been. Because there's a gentleman by the name of C.H. Oh, the K oh no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Then and a lot of videos on YouTube really over-exaggerate this letter yeah. and make it into like a much bigger deal, but we're, we're going to give yep. you it straight. Now they, a lot of other videos make it sound like this is some sort of like internal document that's circulating, that's circulating inside the CIA where people were inferring this. But in actuality, if you read it, it's a private citizen who is reaching out to the CIA because it seems like he's really interested in just mysterious ocean phenomenon and ships disappearing and planes disappearing. It's a gentleman by the name of C.H. Mark. Uh, it's a gentleman from Arizona. And he, and there's this really cool letter that he sends out. And he sends a letter to the CIA in May 29th of 1958. In his first letter, it's inferred from his second letter that he's sending out that he is really interested in what's going on with these disappearances of ships and airplanes just out in there and he's commenting on it and i really love the he reaches out to this um in the letter that circulates online now it's a second letter that he's sending back to the cia and he's referencing this and the person that he's reaching out to is redacted and i absolutely love the uh, cia's previous uh response that get they gave him to his first letter which reads as the following. Ah. Dear Mr. Mark, on behalf of Mr. Uh, Duelis, who, by the way, was the director of the CIA at the time in this, in 1958, I says, may I, uh, I acknowledge and thank you for your letter uh, from May of 29th. Although we are unable to answer your questions, uh, your letter was very interesting, and we appreciate the concern in these matters. Sign, redacted, assistant to the director. <laughs> like the Dwight K. Schrute of the CIA in 1958 reaches out and just says, Thank you for your inquiry. We're not going to respond to you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, because again, like back then, like this is when, when this letter is being sent to the CIA, this is like nine years prior to the Freedom of Information Act. So it's essentially just private citizens back in the time are just reaching out to the CIA, asking them questions. And the CIA is just going, we're, we're just not going to answer this. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Okay. So we have a mysterious shift with a bunch of people with odd symptoms that we can't solidly subscribe to anything. We have some people who show up at a convenient time. A Check very <laughs> convenient time, then, by the way. They're not that far off uh, off shipping lanes, though. But they, they show up at a very convenient time. And escape Check, the... And they escape I, the I, I'm getting right? to it. <laughs> they find people just totally screwed up. They deconstruct the scene as much as they can. And then escape in an extremely convenient time. There you go. I, I'm giving you to on that. Because that sure is that was a very on there. convenient one. But... Like, the thing is... I, I, I can come up with a, an alternate scenario that also is going to somewhat fit it. Like, because may, maybe this is what happens. After after major wars break out, another thing that happens besides, um, like, people trying to hide away weapons and steal technology is antiquities get displaced. These people are antiquity smugglers, and they're transporting something that has some really bad juju in it. Um, they end up falling under some sort of curse, awaken an ancient demon, Cthulhu wakes up out of his idol. Something like that happens, screws everyone up. The people who show up, check it out, realize, okay, something really bad happened, and one of the crew members do the smart thing and blow up the ship to prevent the ancient evil. You sound like you just described the plot of the fourth Mummy movie. I have like, not seen it. Like the Brendan Fraser is going to show up <laughs> just to save us from whatever catastrophe befell the people of the Orang Badan. I have not seen anything past the first Mummy movie, which was mediocre at it best. Just, it, well, they all get progressively worse over time. Thank you very much. But but my, my point is more, you can almost subscribe whatever narrative to this you want. The thing is, it's such a there's enough hard fact to to draw you in. 
there's enough ambiguity to make it a blank canvas and there's enough ev evocation to make your imagination project onto that blank canvas whatever you want to fill into it like it's a fascinating story it's really neat but nothing quite fully fits i think that one of the things that makes this story so amazing and draw so many people in is that it has that special lack of information that allows ufo people to see it as a ufo thing Paranormal people to see it as a paranormal thing. People who are into conspiracies to see a conspiracy. If it looks like a conspiracy, sounds like a conspiracy, it feels like a conspiracy, it's probably a conspiracy. Okay? Thank, thank you for making my point. I'm just saying. I think you're I think you're really underestimating the evil of Unit 731. No, I'm not. They're terrible. Okay. Uh, they're, I mean, they're awful human beings. But, no, I mean, they're, they were, they're terrible, but there's yeah. nothing to directly connect them to this situation. That's true. That's true. But and it's just, it's so, it's so coincidental. All of the events that go down, there has to feel like there, there's some sort of higher moving moving that's going on in here okay? oh there's there's certainly more moving parts to this yeah. there is definitely something that occurred there but the thing is this we don't have knowledge of those moving parts there's right. definitely a bigger picture here but the thing is it's so hard to subscribe it to a singular thing without making large leaps in conjecture like like we're attributing it to like say ufos even right. though there's nothing to really connect to ufos or to this um, shady group that definitely existed and definitely did some really heinous things but there's nothing really there to force that connection besides this would make sense for a motive mm -hmm. um, it's a fascinating story I believe something bizarre truly bizarre happened there maybe it's even something that we don't even fully understand but it is a great mystery but uh, let's get into our thoughts Okay, uh, I'm going to go first. Um, so it's probably not hard to get to what my final thought is. I, I think, at the very least, everything that is going on here has a human element to it. I think the circumstances surrounding how um, quickly the, the, the rescue comes to this ship, how it's very timely that everybody's able to evacuate the ship in time for there's there, there to be this explosion. So in some way, shape, or form humans wanted this ship to sink for whatever reason that it is. So I think everything surrounding the sinking of the ship probably had a human element to it. Now, the events that transpired on the ship, it it could have been something other interesting in the paranormal, and maybe that's the reason that it explodes, just to cover up whatever that it is. Or, or... To give it as a reason about as to why the ship wasn't towed back to a particular port. You know, true that it was true that this was sunk, but we've never been able to find the wreckage of this in any way, shape, or form. Maybe something happened to it, and that's the reason why they explain why it's not there anymore, so they could just tow it somewhere else where it has to be. I don't know. It's just too convenient all the moving pieces for for the for the people getting off of the ship. For me not to think there's just some sort of human component as to what happened to to the 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 end the end of this story. Okay, for me, first, I don't think that this is just a bit of folklore. I think that the, these stories represent actual events. So whatever happened there, I think it was real. I think that the many of the experiences that we reported are likely true to the experiences of the people who were there. I think something truly bizarre there happened. Something that maybe even a unique case because i'm i'm hard pressed to find something else connected to this something overly similar to it and i think that whatever caused the explosion if the explosion did occur i think that it was intentional it is too coincidental for that just to be the case like even if you take the ch the stance of oh it exploded because they were tr they were transporting chemicals that re react poorly to water, and the water was leaking and slowly, it's just too much of a coincidence for the explosion to occur, right as they're getting off at that very last moment. I think it's far more like that one of the people on that boat, while down there in cargo container I think it was four, while they had a moment alone, 
went ahead and planted something that they brought in with them or found something to detonate. The other thing I'll say about this story is if they are transporting something, I don't think the crew was aware of it. And I think the crew were smugglers. Those are the facts I can take away with it. The rest, feel free to fill in the blanks. I thought this went 12 different directions. And I don't have any conclusions as much better than Cthulhu did it. Yeah. It's it's definitely a hard puzzle to put together. But that's why we wanted to bring this one to you guys. Absolutely. It is, it is a real thinker. And I'd love for all you guys to take a crack at this one. Also... I want to know how many of you guys had heard of this before. Like, mm-hmm. please comment below if you were either aware or not aware of this thing's existence. Because I, I had heard of this story for quite some time. I know Marcus had not heard about it before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, if there's some details in the story that we're missing or that you guys think that we're overlooking, put those in the comments below so that we can talk about this. Not in our next episode, guys, because remember, we're going on vacation. It's going to be in the episode after that, but we're going to have to compile all the comments for, for that. But definitely leave your guys' comments because we're going to come back to this because we want to know your guys' opinions on what you think happened to the crew of the Orangbadan. Now, um, if you guys are enjoying this podcast, we're probably about to go into our pillow talk uh, for the podcast. For those of you that aren't aware, um, uh, we uh, continue the podcast for uh, all of our people that support us on Patreon. We do another 15 minutes. So if you guys uh, enjoy uh, this podcast and want to get the rest of this podcast, just go over to our Patreon and sign up. But until next time, guys, keep believing. Because we'll keep listening. Okay, I think that's our first episode in a long time where we couldn't come to real definitive conclusions. I think I agree with you. And we definitely disagreed a lot as to what the actual outcome of that ship can be. So it's 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 a mystery that's just hard to to explain. I mean, I know we've done it before, but it's been a while. We usually can come to some pretty <laughs> pretty weird conclusions, but that one that one's hard. But it, it was very interesting. I was glad that we could talk about it here. But okay. So, what are we talking about in our extended segment? All right. So, for the pillow talk today, for all of our patrons out there, I thought that we could talk about some ghost ships that we would like to investigate. Maybe kind of tell some stories about some stuff that we found. What would we love to go investigate? And I'm going to kick it off first. So, I I was looking back for a lot of the, the older stuff, but you know, you guys know me. I like... I like newer stuff that's out there. The, the newest stuff that can come out always just seems to just grab me. And that's a contrast well with mine because mine's really <laughs> old. <laughs> and and I, I heard about this really cool ghost ship that uh, washed up on the shores of Cork in Ireland back in February 2020. Have you heard about this? Yeah. Okay. And... Yeah, this was actually one I was considering for mine too. Yeah, it's really cool. And uh, the, the ship was the Alta. And this was a, a cargo vessel that essentially drifted on the high seas for about a year and a half. How this thing didn't sink, how it didn't crash beforehand, how it wasn't salvaged by pirates is a huge mystery and in and of, in and of.